Hello, everyone. Thank you, Millie. Please do keep your mobile devices on. Please use them. We'll screen the Twitter feed so you can subvert the evening by saying it's rubbish. Uh, we'd prefer it if you would uh, join in. Um, so the event begins on time. It's 7 o'clock now. It'll end on time. And it's a public meeting. We used to do them in Britain. People had opinions, and we heard them. And we've been bringing them back here. So we, we look forward to you joining in. I'm going to bring the evening in in three stages, though. So I would ask you to bear this in mind. We don't, in the best possible way, want you to get too excited early on. Um, we're going to do Coney the Man for a few minutes. Uh, where is he now? How much power does he wield? What effect will intervention have? Coney 2012, the film, will come as a section just after that. The pros and cons. Why has it been successful? Should other NGOs learn from it? Is it colonialistic old Aryan rubbish? Uh, or do we love it? And then clicktivism and slacktivism. A bunch of teenagers in their bedroom joining up to something good or bad will come towards the end. So please try and group your thoughts uh, early on. <laughs> So welcome, everyone. It's a public meeting. Don't leave without raising things you care about. But we have got a fabulous panel, which is not unusual at the Frontline Club. And thank you, Millie, for assembling them. Could I stop talking now? Uh, I'm going to chair it ruthlessly. But could I ask the panel to introduce themselves, starting with Musa, who's next to me, and also a line about the subject we're all here for, what would you most like us to know about your opinion about Coney 2012? More, most importantly... And your name. Uh, well, there you go. Most importantly, um, what I'd like um, you to know about my view on 2012 is that I ultimately welcome the visibility of the issue, but I feel that we need to treat this video as a platform for further inquiry into why he's been allowed to do what he's done as long as he has. Um, secondary importance, my name is Musa Kwonga. I am a poet, um, football writer, and... Uh, musician. Uh, my parents are from northern Uganda and I blog for The Independent, among others, on various issues including Kony 2012. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, I'm Benjamin. Um, Chesterton. Uh, thank you, <laughs> allegedly. And uh, I run a company called Duck Rabbit. I'm formerly a radio documentaries producer. Duck Rabbit do still produce radio documentaries. We make a lot of things we call photo films. We work a lot with NGOs. We're currently producing Oxfam's next TV advert, which will be on TV in, in um, April. My thing about Coney is I think it's a genuine historic landmark uh, moment, uh, but I haven't yet been able to watch the whole film because I'm still <laughs> scraping the vomit off my <laughs> laptop, for which I've sent a bill to Invisible Children. <laughs> I'm sure it will be settled, the bill. Um, yeah, I'm sure. Um, hello, I am Marika Shamiros. I am right. the Consortium Director of the Justice and Security Research Programme at the London School of Economics. Can you hear at the back? No. Can we have oh. something like See, a microphone? I have a, or I, have a, I have a microphone, but I also have a small voice. And a well, small we'll microphone. sort it out. It's only so the introduction. I'll, I'll sort shout. this out. I'll start again. My name is Marika Shamiros. I'm the Consortium Director of the Justice and Security Research Programme at the London School of Economics and Political Science. And one of the, uh, I, it's very hard for me to find one line to talk about this issue since I've talked about it for many, many years. What's been very interesting for me in the aftermath of the Coney 2012 campaign is the amount of hate mail that I have received based on some of the criticism that I've written or also other, other bits and pieces that I've written about the LRA over the years. And the, the hate mail shows a complete devotion to believing anything that you are told and a complete refusal to try and understand anything right. and basically I'm, just I'm going to interrupt text. you because people at the back aren't hearing you. Okay, um, I'll get... The, the, the Marie, Marika just said she had hate mail for criticising yeah. the LRA. I think that's right. Just hold it to your mouth, Marika. There's two I seats at the front here, if you'd like yes, to. Yes, please, come here. Right, Marika, hold it close to you. But Actually, is this a, a Frontline Club campaign? You <laughs> don't right, want me better. to... Um, yeah. <laughs> just come. Do come in, but do, okay. in the nicest possible way, do get to the point and then pass it on. <laughs> I'm Marika, and by now you've all heard my name and I'll pass it on. Thank you. Uh, I'm Callum McRae. Uh, I first uh, made a film uh, in, in the north of Uganda about the LRA in, I think, 2003, and I've been making films and writing uh, off and on ever since. Um, <coughs> I remember in 2003 writing, uh, at that point, the, dis the whole war hadn't even been discussed, um, the security in the West, that is. The Security Council um, hadn't discussed it, hadn't debated it, and uh, the world was deeply disengaged. And I remember writing, if they were stealing oil rather than children, perhaps the world would pay attention. 
Um, lo and behold, here we are. The world has paid attention, and I'm hating every minute of it. Um, uh, there is a certain commonality of line here, which is that this is a dreadful, I'm afraid, campaign. But nonetheless, um, very important, and we need to discuss it. A very interesting evening already. And to you, Amanda. Thank you. My name's Amanda Weisbaum. I'm the programme director for War Child. We work in northern Uganda. We also work in the Central African Republic, where atrocities from the LRA are happening as well. And um, yes, I would love a five million or however many hundred million hits on our videos in that short space of time. Um, and good luck to them for doing that. But the message is wrong. It's not about Kony. It's about the children and who is suffering within the areas that the LRA are in at this time. Thank you very much. So um, who in the audience has seen it? Could you sh have a show of hands in the room if you've seen it? And uh, it's about half. Can you keep your, keep your hands up, please? Can you keep your hands up if you've seen it through to the end? <laughs> okay, so wow. it's, a, it's a little bit less. So we're in a room where the panel hasn't seen it all to the end, uh, <laughs> although they don't like it, and, uh, that, and half of you have seen it. So let's see a bit of it. Um, over to the technology, you may not hear any of it, but here is something of about two minutes, I believe, and it may have sound, and if we turn the lights down, we could then actually see it. But obviously, oh! There you go. It's always been that the decisions made by the few, with the money and the power, dictated the priorities of their government and the stories in the media. They determine the lives and the opportunities of their citizens. But now there is something bigger than that. The people of the world see each other and can protect each other. It's turning the system upside down and it changes everything. We are living in a new world, Facebook world, in which 750 million people share ideas not thinking in borders. It's a global community bigger than US. Joseph Kony was committing crimes for 20 years and no one cared. We care. We have reached a crucial time in history where what we do or don't do right now will affect every generation to come. Arresting Joseph Kony will prove that the world we live in has new rules that the technology that has brought our planet together is allowing us to respond to the problems of our friends. We need to end finally by bringing Kony justice. It should be celebrated like worldwide. We are not just studying human history. We are shaping it. At the end of my life, I want to say that the world we've left behind is one that Gavin can be proud of a place that doesn't allow Joseph Konings and child soldiers. A place where children, no matter where they live, have a childhood free from fear. I'm going to be like you, Dad. When you grow up? Yeah. Are you sure? I'm going to come with you to Africa. The better world we want is coming. It's just waiting for us to stop at nothing. Okay, so we're going to discuss the film uh, in just a second. Let's start with Coney the Man. Let's go in reverse order. If you could kindly use the microphone. It's probably been taken away from you for yeah. fear that you might be heard. Um, but uh, uh, speak up until it returns. Sorry, Millie. It's easy. Thank you for arranging the evening. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> Coney the Man, where is he now? How much power does he wield? Let's go up the, up the panel and then into the room. I don't care where he is, but he, he reeked the name wreaks havoc in the areas in which we work where there has been LRA activity the name LRA wreaks havoc with the populations and whether it's general banditry with a sign that says LRA people are suffering and in Central African Republic there's 26,000 people who have been displaced because of the name whether it's in Central African Republic in DRC or in Uganda I don't care the name has to go. It has to actually stop being there. It affects people. Um, I don't really know what to say about him. I mean, uh, clearly this is a psychopathic uh, cult leader 
um, who is a killer and who rules by fear, kidnapping, and, you know, is in that sense um, a, a, a very, very dangerous individual and nobody, you know, we would all be very happy, and I don't say this normally, um, if, uh, you know, if he wasn't here anymore. Um, the problem is that, that what he has been turned into, he is all those things, but the fact that he's been turned into an African bogeyman, um, which people can unite, um, uh, you know, which appeals to a kind of um, a simple religious, um, uh, 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 particularly in, in America, nonsense, um, is really, really dangerous. And actually, you know, we should be looking, we shouldn't be lowering ourselves to the level of, of coin or the people who, who see him as an African bogeyman. We should be looking at the issues that are raised by it. Um, and that's the important issue. I'm afraid, you know, I, 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 Kony, Kony, I'm calling him Cone. His name is Coin. He's known as Coin in, in Uganda. But they don't call him that in the film. Um, uh, I've always called him Coin because that's what people in Uganda call him. Um, so, I mean, even the name, you know, has, has become weirdly uh, distorted. But the important issue is the politics of this, the important issue, and also the sinister way in which people have latched onto this notion of an African bogeyman. Um, where is he now? I have no idea, but I'm sure if we ask the American intelligence officers, they could probably tell us this. Um, and in fact, for many, many years, people have known where he, where he was, and um, that never seemed to have prompted any action for various political and economical reasons. Many organizations who work in LRA-affected areas have started to refer to the LRA um, as the LRA phenomenon, which kind of feeds into uh, what you just said, that the name stands for something that the man actually isn't. And, and I completely follow Callum with this. That of course, you know, the, it, it, if, if the LRA was brought to an end, it would make the situation a lot clearer. And I, I think that's one of the most important points that we need to remember. If you go into LRA-affected areas and spend significant amounts of time there, it's very, very clear that the situation is actually much, much messier than elevating one man to this level of superpower. Um, it's been always very interesting to me talking about Coney the Man, especially to American military guys who have absolutely no problem looking you straight in the eye and saying, well, but he, you know, he has all these powers and he has these special powers and that's why we need to get him. And I say to them, look, really, do you really honestly believe it that one man can be responsible for messing about, what is it now, five national armies and three UN missions and the US army and the French army and sometimes the Israeli army? Really, if you believe that this is the deed of one man, there's something really wrong with your common sense and that's a dangerous thing for a military man. I mean, I've got n no idea where he is, to be honest. Sorry. Sorry. But, um, but I do take a little issue with the idea that what we've seen, even though it's vomit-inducing, is, is dangerous. I think you're sort of ascribing a power to it that I'm not sure is actually um, in this film. Neither do I think the fact that we, it's created a huge amount of debate is, is, is dangerous. I think that's actually a very, very... Um, Good thing. Yeah, we're not on the film good. yet. Where sure. is he? How much power does he wield? <coughs> you don't know. Well, give it to Musa then. Give it over. Um, <laughs> um, Joseph Conn, uh, who is he? He's a monster. Uh, he's been allowed to run riot. Um, he's possibly in the Central African Republic. Um, there's talk that his influence is much diminished. Uh, there's talk that the LRA now consists of bands of two to three people. Uh, that's the recent, most recent thing I read about it. Um, I suppose the, the fine thing I'd say about Joseph Conn really is that he came to power, um, or he began his LRA, um, in response to Joseph Mus uh, President Museveni's um, uh, seizure of power uh, in the, in the mid-'80s, and then he evolved into a kind of Colonel Kurtz figure. He should be stopped, but we should also ask questions about who enabled um, his escape so many times. So um, we're asked questions. Um, maybe the microphones are working. Millie, are they? Just, 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 just to say, justice is important, right? Of course. So th that's what they're being asked for, is some justice. OK, to the room. That's can you hear the yes. contributors? I totally agree with you. Totally yeah. agree with you. So let's g go to the room. Questions can be asked. Does anyone have any at this stage? Who is, who is he? Where is he? Yes, there's a question here. And then we're whipping along. Where does he get his money from? Where does he get his money from? Panel? He doesn't, ha uh, he doesn't have significant amounts of money. Um, he, he, he steals and he plunders L uh, villages. He steals and he plunders. Um, he has been supplied in the past significantly uh, by the Khartoum government, 
Um, basically, you had a situation. I mean, that this that you know, this is when you start to get into the com complexities of it. Basically, you had a situation where you had um, Uganda supporting the SPLA as a proxy against Khartoum, and you had Khartoum supporting the LRA as a, as a proxy against Uganda and indeed against the SPLA. So there were all sorts of complex issues going on in there. There was there were quite a lot of arms coming from Khartoum. I believe for a time that they were coming from Sorry. Khartoum um, uh, more recently. I'm not actually so sure they are now. Uh, but uh, now I've completely, this is, this, this is the new age, <laughs> right? Yeah. I'm sitting here talking. <laughs> I'm listening to you, I'm looking at you. And I'm going, yeah, what's everybody lines. looking at? Yeah. <laughs> well, you've answered the question, where did you get the money, Bob? And then, uh, anyone else have a question about this? Yes, over here, who is the man, where is he? And then we'll do a little bit of intervention. Um, on the ground, uh, in the areas where he's wreaked havoc, what is the local attitude and feeling towards Kony? Terrible. Absolutely fear and hatred. Well, actually, it's funny, just to add to that, um, there was talk uh, in the, I mean, there's this mass uh, displacement. Um, the, I think the camps, the IDP camps in Uganda, up to 1.7 million capacity at one point. What's an IDP? Internally displaced persons um, over the last 20 odd years. Um, the thing that I would say in terms of how he's regarded, there, there was once said that there, there were sort of many people that the children feared um, at night. And one of them was the LRA. The other one was the Ugandan army, actually. Absolutely. So we can't forget Absolutely. their role in all of this. That's and, a vital and, part. And of maybe, the sorry, maybe just, just to add to that, actually, sorry. if you go into South Sudan, where because the LRA were a proxy force for Khartoum for so many years, um, and you go into villages and ask comprehensively by whom have these people been attacked over the many years, um, half of them <coughs> have also been attacked by the Ugandan army, by the UPDF, in addition to being attacked by the LRA which is really a fact that that's tends to be overlooked because it's all wrapped up into the LRA phenomenon. So is this the point you were making? We'll, we'll cut you two at the end because it is, it, does every child in Uganda up recently had to fear violence, fear war, fear uniformed people and laws resistant army people? Is yes. that the point? Yes, indeed. I mean, you, you have um, somebody in uniform go into your village and you don't know whether they're peaceful or not and you, you presume that they're not peaceful. So, you know, there is fear. And yeah. in South Sudan and, and in the and, and in Northern and DRC. And in CAR. And uh, I mean, uh, you know, if you look at the situation before uh, the, the LRA were scattered, I mean, you know, the, the Ugandan government keep talking about how they defeated the LRA and drove them and defeated them. They didn't. They were scattered by a combination of, of um, Ugandan incompetence and American um, encouragement. Um, uh, in, a, in a disastrous uh, military uh, uh, assault and offensive, um, uh, which is effectively what um, invisible children are still proposing. Um, but the situation for so many years was you had these people, the, the, the Acholi were, um, were uh, forced into huge IDP camps. They were, I visited them, they were absolutely awful places. They were ridden with disease, they were incredibly dangerous, they were not protected. The LRA would come in at night and attack them. Um, the UPDF would do nothing to do them. So as far as the, the, the people of northern Uganda and the Choli people were concerned, there were two enemies out to get them. There were the, um, the Ugandan government, which effectively kept them in something which was little more than concentration camps. Uh, and then they were m and the, the LRA marauding against them. Um, it was very difficult when you were in that situation to distinguish much between the LRA and the UPDF. So, so for, the, for our audience, Co there's a question here. Coney the man is one aggressor. Mm. Who's it? Well, I, I don't want to say any more because it's all been said, but I agree with that, yeah. yeah. Uh, would re removing Kony actually mean the end of the LRA? Or no, not at all. Have? I mean, basically, in, in Central African Republic, in the su southeastern border, it's basically banditry. And they use the words LRA to be part of that banditry and, and instill fear and um, for people to give up. It, things, whatever they may be, and so, and there's no hierarchy. At least at one point there was some form of hierarchy, and now it's just there. There is a faction of banditry that goes on where they're using this name of, in fear of, of the LRA. So the film calls for intervention. Um, what effect would intervention have? Uh, just down the panel, who who feels intervention would help in this part of the world? Musa, with you, and then we'll change subject. So well, you mean military intervention? There is intervention already with Africom. They've got the 100 soldiers there as a, you know, keeping a watching brief with the Ugandan army. So there is intervention. I think that it's strange because the video calls for more, but it's already there. OK. I don't think it would help. Intervention from abroad doesn't help, or within Africa? Well, with it, as a military force, no, I don't think it would help at this stage. 
Well, I think what's currently been going on, and we have to keep in mind that this is not a new thing. This, this partnership, this military partnership between the Ugandan army and the U.S. Army is a very old one, and the U.S. Army has been pumping millions of dollars into the Ugandan army, much of it under the pretense to have this as, as counter LRA activities, but really there's other political issues going on there, which is, for example, the Ugandan army is supporting the USA in Somalia in the fight against al-Shabaab. So this is an old partnership. It goes back a long way. The idea that these 100 new advisors, which, advi which were announced on the 14th of October last year, were anything new was completely ridiculous. And it was really uh, simply President Obama getting up in front of people in the White House and just sort of conveniently hiding away parts of the truth. Um, because, of course, American military had been involved there for a long time, including in the very disastrous mm. military operation so a couple of years ago. So is your position, it's all very bad that don't do anything about it? No, I, my position is that if you, if you narrow, this is a very complex situation, and I think we, we don't need to talk further more about the complexities, but a complex situation requires, by definition, a complex solution. Okay. So if you narrow a space, which is what you do through military intervention, you actually make it impossible to solve a problem comprehensively. Yeah, I mean, the other, the other thing, I mean, there are all sorts of reasons why military intervention um, per se is not a solution. I'm not saying there can be, there should be no military involvement in this situation. Um, but, you know, I have, I, I, I witnessed in 2004 um, uh, a, a, a very successful military assault on the LRA. Um, Two weeks before I was there, um, a camp at Bologna, one of the IDP camps, had been attacked by the LRA. There had been no defence. The uh, UPDF were nowhere to be seen, despite all the support they get. Um, and 300 people were killed, and the camp was burned. It was an awful, awful massacre. I went there two weeks later, and Otema phoned me up and said, look, you've got to come with me. We're going up to the Sudan border. We've just killed 55 rebels. Took me in his little helicopter. We, fl we flew up, and then we walked through the bush, and we reached the site of this victory over the LRA. The first of the 55 dead rebels was four. Um, the rest were like mostly children um, kids. Um, there was a 14-year-old kid who was lying, who'd obviously been lying there for some hours. And you know, I said, "Is he still alive? And is he going to be treated?" And they said, "Oh yes, of course he's going to be treated." And I was hurried on and rushed on. And five minutes later, I was told, "I said, have you done something for the kid?" Um, and I didn't, you know, I've, to this day, wish I'd just stood there. But I, you know, these things happen. You're not bloody perfect in these situations. Um, but I said, "What's happened to the kid?" And they. And he said, oh, uh, one of these guys came up and said, unfortunately, he's died, right? Now, he'd been, he, was, he wasn't about to die right away, I don't think. Um, uh, I, so I think he was, he, was, he was smothered, because of course they weren't going to bother taking him back. So, A, the reality of a military victory over an army of kidnapped youth and children is very, very unpalatable. But B, the lessons of history are that it's always gone wrong. It's always scattered them. It's always brought more havoc. So I just add very quick, I completely agree. With, I think I read that report on the BBC website as well about a term turning up. Um, I would just add to that, attaching conditions to military aid, stringent conditions, could be an intervention that would be useful um, in this case. So really just saying we're going to withhold a certain amount of aid unless certain conditions are met in relation to tracking this guy down and some of his bandits. Right, so non-military intervention is something you would, you would favour, some kind of muscular aid. So, I mean, I should, have, I should have clarified as well. I mean, I'm not saying that you can't just withdraw and, and leave them right. to it. Of course, you have to have military activity okay. in the area. But there's also but the financial side as well, I would yeah, say. Yeah, exactly. I mean, and it's a whole yeah. complex yeah. issue. Okay, and we'll return to this at the end. Let's move on to the film then. Um, is anyone in the room, from the panel or from the room, like to speak up for the film? Uh, in the strongest 100% red-blooded way. Can we start with someone who just thinks this is an issue that's finally got aired? Yes, thank you very much. So you have the microphone. Uh, you may have a name. You can share it if you wish. Uh, my name is Katie, and I was redundant when I got this, picked up the thing on Facebook, which is why I had the 28 minutes to spare to watch it all the way through. Um, 29 I, minutes. I do agree that it's a little mawkish, but I think that's an American-English thing. I don't think it's uh, campaigning. Thing. I think that's just a difference in tone. I see that on social media sites all the time. Um, absolutely, I agree that it's complex. But for me, fundamentally, I think I am quite an ignorant person. I don't know the complex details. I don't pretend to understand how to solve the world's problems. But to bring so much focus and actually get to a stage where these people want to discuss it, go. it's got to be a good thing. And we can all be a little supercilious and rattle our guardians about it. But I think that it's, you know, we could be a little bit, sorry, maybe I'm getting as uh, sarcastic <laughs> as other people. <laughs> well, let's uh, go, but let uh, go. I think it would be, a, I think it's a good thing. Let's go around the room. You react first. Yeah, no, I, I would, look, actually, I mean, I wrote a piece about this and saying I welcome the scrutiny, you know, quite frankly. Um, but there are wider questions to be asked. 
Yeah, thank you. Um, just my quick comment on the film itself. My opinion of the film is that it's very simplistic of a very serious issue and obviously very complex. And obviously, the other part of it is also that for some reason, LR is being picked as if like LR was fighting on its own. Musa, I think you're qual quite well aware of the atrocities that Museveni and his soldiers committed on the population of northern Uganda that created the LR in the first place. And obviously, Jason Russell, yeah, he's done a great job, but I think he falls too far short and he makes a very complex co conflict, very simplistic indeed. Yes, I agree. Thank I agree. you for that. And, and very essentially as well. To this lady in the front, would, would anyone like to react, respond to our friend there, Ben? Would you like to respond to what we've heard? No. Because you agree with him? Yes. Right? Um, yeah, in terms of, uh, I completely agree that the films encouraged a uh, level of dialogue that we've never seen before, but th um, I, I, my opinion will be the problem lies in openly advocating military intervention, ignoring voices, for Can example. Can you use the mic? I'm so sorry. Sorry. Um, ignoring the voices of um, organisations like the Acholi Religious Leaders who have been explicitly advocating peace talks, and this is something I'd also like your opinion on. Um, does peace still have a chance right. for one well, of a better we'll phrase? Right, we'll get the panel's opinion. What's your opinion? Is this film good or bad? It's good up to a point, but it could have been done a lot better without advocating military intervention as the final solution. But it without. wasn't done. For 20 years, no one made this film. You For 20 years, no one film. made this film, but they didn't have to make it, um, ignoring the lessons of history from Operation Lightning Thunder and every single military intervention so that has gone wrong. The fact that 85 million people have seen it, you want them to have a history lesson as part two, do you? Or is, yeah. it, do they, is it just <laughs> The history it? lesson is coming, but I think there's a, de there's a degree of the unethical in, telling, in um, dressing up what military intervention as uh, as a short film. What do you with most hate about it? The man who made it? No, no, um, the, the, um, <laughs> nothing to do with the messenger. The message itself, it's not just that it's too simplistic, but it didn't leave any opinion open other than, than intervention. That is where, that is the fatal flaw. Please keep the microphone. You want the, you want the panel to respond to your question, so yes, please, please do. We'll start with you, Ben. The lady wants a briefing. I just think there's huge uh, double standards at play in the critique of this film. And I, I, I agree with much of the um, critique, but the, the media, the journalistic media, has not simplified and does not simplify this story. The NGOs do not simplify um, stories. I mean, this is just pure advocacy. And they're only doing what lots of organisations have been doing for a long time. They just did it better. Do you agree with that with the mic? Um, yes, up to um, up to a point. I agree that they've done it a lot better, and um, advocacy is a battlefield, and the the ones who do it best wins. And it's not to say there's no room for the invisible children aesthetic in advocacy. Amanda, but it's the it's the it's the final goal of the film that I have a problem with that they didn't leave any other solutions. Yeah, open. I mean they had they did 29 minutes 27 seconds of filming, and they didn't really do any history surrounding it or the complexities surrounding it, and they certainly didn't, they, there was one th scene in it where they had the 30,000 children and it's as if, you know, once we get Coney, those 30,000 children will all be happy. It's like, uh-uh, go and see our programs, please. Go and do, you know, work with the psychosocial units that we are working with, with those children in Northern Uganda and in Central African Republic. They didn't give any of that history at all. Well, even worse, actually. Sorry, and yes, I would have loved the 100 million hits. <laughs> <laughs> I would say it was even worse. Not only did they not give the history, but they actually made it sound as if the moment that Coney gets arrested, the 30,000 children will walk out of the bush. Well, exactly. Magically. You know, we know Rubbish. for a fact. And so know the invisible children. There are not no 30,000 children in the bush. So that kind of should already be the first time that there's a different story here, and that was completely discarded. Musa? I would just, uh, was someone else going to speak because I've spoken plenty. Were you going to say something? Okay, well, <laughs> but, but our friend may want to briefly from you, after all. Do you. Have you heard roughly what you wanted from... Okay, so can you I, have can the I, mic... Sorry, can I just pick up on one thing, which is about the peace talks? <laughs> because um, I think that you raised the whole question about the peace talks and the alternative and the Acholi religious leaders and uh, Matput and all the traditions of reconciliation and so on, um, which are very important and significant. I don't think they're a solution, but they are hold enormous hope for the rebuilding of that society, things like Matput. Okay. But the, the important... Sorry, this is really quite important. The, the peace talks... Operation Lightning Thunder was unilaterally or it was organized. And when, when the peace talks were happening and the peace talks were stumbling along, these were spectacularly flawed peace talks. Everyone was, was compromised. They were very, very dodgy. Uh, coin was being intransigent. The Ugandan government were not committed and serious. Um, but 
the fact is that while those peace talks stumbled on, the level of death and the level of killing and the level of horror was dramatically, mm -hmm. dramatically reduced. And, the, and people started returning home, and there was a transformation and in Callum, the atmosphere in the area. Just sorry, and, and that military intervention and right, launched preemptively um, by uh, the support of America by Uganda and the so-called support of, Uganda, uh, of uh, um, Southern Sudan and, and the CAR right. uh, was what destroyed that process. It was catastrophic and it was responsible for the situation we have just now. It was responsible for the scattering of the LRA. It's not just that they're ignoring the potential of the peace talks. It's that those peace talks were something right. and is, they were is, destroyed. Is a peace talk, are peace talks better than a film? Well, I mean, you know, films are film. I've made four films and nobody's paid a blind bit of attention to them. Right. So, you know, <laughs> okay. so, so we're talking about the film. We're talking yeah, about I, the film. Um, my name's Artie. I'm a news editor at ITV News. Um, I agree about the Where comments about the film. It was very Thanks. simplistic. I myself have also been to northern Uganda and Gulu. I'm part Ugandan myself. Um, but I do think the film was egotistical. It was very simple. However, you've got to look at the media coverage of this entire story. Wall-to-wall -wall coverage on Absolutely. CNN, uh, picked up by NBC News for Nightly News, uh, which then did a follow-up in Gulu, uh, which we were, ITV News was involved with. We also did something on ITV News. Moose was on Channel 4 News. Surely that sort of coverage can only be good. OK, and keep, uh, we'll just pass the microphone over here, and then to you, the lady behind you. Um, um, should, this, should more NGOs be doing this, Amanda? Is the message, you're a bit dated, thanks for your war child, Tony's <laughs> come along. And, and he's going to yeah. get the saviour of the world. Now, I keep on saying that I would love the 100 million hits, but it has a price to pay. And every single NGO is going to want to have those 100 million hits. You can imagine the Save the Children's and the Oxfam's. They're... they're they're doing it now. It's like, oh, how can we do it? It's like there's got to be a, a different way of doing it. Social media, well, we'll get on to that, I'm sure. We are going to, yes, we're going to move on to it next. But in terms of the film, does it shame NGOs? No. <laughs> it doesn't tell any part of they the story themselves. about it. No, they because it, it, so it, no, really it's sorry. very now, arrogant in, in terms of the invisible children are the only ones who can help. I, I will shut up in the next section because I'm just talking <laughs> far too much. But the point is that you're just saying, is the publicity is a good thing? It's like the basic argument of the film, which is make coin famous or yeah. coney famous. Um, it, that is not the point. The point is that if what you're doing is you're legitimizing American involvement in Uganda, you're legitimizing the deeply corrupt Museveni government, you're legitimizing a very, very potentially dangerous situation um, in, in that part of Africa, that's not good, that's bad. And that's what this film does. To me, what the film does primarily is it packages something in a very modern way and it uses very modern ways, but that actually at the heart of it is an arch conservative and conformative, conformist and ancient message, which is send in the troops and that brings a solution. Send and the Marines. It, it yeah. Particularly in these parts of the world, but I would probably argue in any part of the world, an American soldier on the ground is not a solution. And it's not, it doesn't spell safety for the people who see the American soldiers coming. And it doesn't spell safety for the people who then see the Ugandan army coming together with the American soldiers. It makes absolutely no sense from the point of view of a civilian who's been told that 100 military advisors will come in and help. 100 military advisors. It's if you go and announce it, that means you're not in to take somebody out covertly, so that's ridiculous. And if you want to protect people, civilians, with 100 military advisors, that is equally nonsensical. Okay, and do you want to comment, you two? What was the question? No, can you don't. <laughs> yes, um, I'm at a school where once I'd seen the video, we all shared it around by Facebook almost immediately. I think the simplicity of the video might have made it so successful with people my age, because if the film went into such detail in 30 minutes, I don't think people would have, like, watched the whole film all together, especially at my age, I'm not sure that it would have caught but on. But to what end? But here quite she, quite sorry, quite what's quite your name? Rosie. Rosie, so here Rosie, here Rosie is, and there's, <laughs> <laughs> and there I'm you sure Grower is much better than mine. Spokesperson of her generation. But, <laughs> no, but there are, She's here. where, where <laughs> do you think we start with getting interested in issues in Africa? Do you think we all start with PhDs? Do you think we all start with MPhils? We have to start somewhere. Now, that huge number of people, a certain percentage of them, will go away and find out more and become engaged and become and maybe do something, right? Maybe do something better than sitting around debating it. Maybe actually go and help in some small way, OK? So you can't, not everybody starts with this really, really nuanced view of that continent and what's going on there. I don't agree with the film. But also, I wouldn't say that you can't, some good can't come out of it. 
I think many questions come out of it, precisely those kind of questions, yeah. because we don't actually know whether more attention translates into a better situation. We don't actually know whether people watching a video will translate into doing better things. We don't actually really know what better things are. Well, you're, you're, but we wouldn't want to let Rosie think that her attention doesn't matter. She didn't have any attention on this topic until the film came along. Does that matter? Well, we don't know that. No, but do, does Rosie's attention matter to you? Well, we don't, well, well Rosie, what are you going to do no now? <laughs> How can you say? Are you, get, are you going to apply to War Child to be, you know, a, I don't know, an advocate or a press officer or um, something of that I nature? I don't think I've... I can do much personally, but the fact that I told my parents about it... But yes, you, you can. can. We all, we can people Obama. can do things. <laughs> He's here. <laughs> OK, what, we're coming to you. Your lecturing is, is quite a good subject. We'll come on to that. You're, le you're being lectured from the, from the panel. <laughs> Musa, you wanted to contribute, then we're coming to you. Then the mags at the back. OK, I'm itching to say this. I think it's utterly patronising to say that children can't handle complexity or young people can't handle complexity. You look at The Dark Knight, look at Game of Thrones. These are complex narratives. Lord of the Rings. Harry Potter. People followed complex narratives involving multiple characters over seven books with Harry Potter. You're telling me they can't watch a half hour film? How would the mention of one name, President Museveni, in a half hour film have, have, have added such complexity to Invisible Children's message? It couldn't have been in there. I totally, utterly reject that. So premise. it's like leaving the hobbits out. Basically. <laughs> no, 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 no. It's like including the hobbits. It's like including the hobbits and the feet aren't hairy because they can't handle hairy feet. It's ridiculous. Yeah. Um, um, okay, I'm Belinda and I'm from the Ugandan community, the Choli community, a group up in northern Uganda. And, uh, Welcome. I am one of the people who has not actually watched the video. <laughs> I you chose. Hate it. You hate it anyway. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's because I'm very much aware of the agenda of the invisible children and several attempts by the Choli community to engage them to discuss the real issue. Why LRA emerged and why other rebel groups exist in Uganda. And I think they don't want to discuss head politics, just how they created the video to make people rush to watch it, like just waking up and going to buy coffee, because it's a treat. But the reality is actually not there. And by their focus and advocacy around militarization as a, an end result, it's just going to make the situation worse. And, and if, if, uh, I, if I gave you 30 minutes to make a film, what would you put in it? Right. First of all, we'd look at why there is chaos in Uganda. We'd look at why the LRA existed and how the issues that makes people resent and take up arms can be addressed in order that people who are still angry and till whose stories have not been heard can be better addressed and in Belinda, able who in would order watch that? who would watch that well They're people would want to watch that down a drain but but no 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 i know he would go like down the drain watch. however the lra soldiers and some of the returnees are fighting in iraq on behalf of other governments <laughs> therefore it means that there's business to be done if that can make headlines then i'm sure there should be reasons why lra issues should be addressed in okay. a way that reflects the situation, Marenka why Amanda. people took up arms. Okay. And I think that's a strong issue you to respond. be looked at. You respond. I, I want to pick up on uh, Musa's excellent point about complexity and, and also your point, really. I think maybe complexity is such a difficult issue to define. What would you put in a film that is more complex? I think honesty, however, and you know, genuine uh, facts would probably help. And I just want to pick up on the, on the film's message that said, stop at nothing. Invisible children do stop at some things. They did stop, for example, in countersigning a protest against a waiver signed by the US government to work with uh, governments that have so child soldiers. Invisible children didn't sign, sign that waiver. Many other NGOs did, so they stopped at that. They do stop, for example, at lobbying the US government to sign the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court because it's politically too Okay, so we'll go around the room. We're going around the room at the moment. You, sir. Um, apparently, there's going to be a Coney 2012 Part 2. What do you expect? <laughs> yeah, tomorrow, 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 yeah, tomorrow. Um, tomorrow. Yeah. Do you think it can be? It can redeem itself. Well, the no. filmmaker was last seen running down the street naked. naked. So, <laughs> who's making it? Do you, can anyone tell us who's they making it? They had editorial. No, they are, they are problem. making. Yeah, they, they are, are making a follow-up, which is officially, so officially Thursday, three o'clock. It was supposed to be Tuesday, 3 o'clock, yeah. and they had editorial problems. D let me well, just uh, ask a question from the chair, if I may. Does, uh, <laughs> does, does the film perpetuate the image of Africans as victims and blonde-haired Westerners ride to the rescue? Musa? I, I don't want to get caught up in that whole white saviour narrative. I, that, that even sounds ugly. It feels ugly coming out of my mouth, that whole reductive narrative of black-white. Um, there's a lot of white people doing very helpful things in northern Uganda. 
I think all you have to look at is the screening itself in northern Uganda and the fact that people just felt really upset. They were getting over the trauma of the conflict. You know, it happened like the worst. It was five years ago. And they just felt really objectified by it. I think that's the answer, really. And yeah, they're putting out a second video because they've been caned for the first one. Mm -hmm. This is a good thing. We need to cane NGOs when they put out rubbish because it does make them shift because they're dependent on the public. But this question about um, how we look at Africa is one that I care passionately about. I used to live in Ethiopia. I took my children to, 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 to live with me uh, in Addis Ababa. Nobody kidnapped them. It was very, very safe. When I went to live there, the first thing I did is I hid in the Hilton Hotel. I was so scared to go outside for about five days. <laughs> I've gone there with this terrible, terrible, uh, pretty racist, I think, idea about what Africa, no such thing as a continent place is. But what, what I don't understand is we're beating up on Kony. Let's take, for example, just briefly, Save the Children. Spent a similar amount of money running a campaign. 90 seconds of babies starving to death on, on your screens. No context, no story, nothing. Wall-to-wall -wall advertising. Why is it all right for Save the Children to do that? with the donor's money, and it's wrong for, for Kony. So we need to widen out this debate, and we need to dig into these NGOs and ask deeper questions about representations, because they matter. Because if someone like me, a Guardian-waving person, <laughs> goes to Ethiopia with essentially what is a, a racist notion about what to expect in Africa, then that means there are many, many other people with the same failings of, as, as, as I had at that time, and had to had to be educated, basically, had to, had, to, had to learn something. So if we are propagating those, those notions of the victim, African people can help themselves. Of course, it's, it's, a, it's a false stereotype. Um, two things, I'd like to pick up on, the, on uh, NGOs. Yes, and there are NGOs that need to answer questions, and my favorite NGO to answer questions is World Vision. Um, which, um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and the thing, um, and the thing about World Vision is, that, you know, I mean, if you go to, if you, I, mean, I have met some lovely people from World Vision in Gulu, and, you know, <laughs> doing all these, doing all these, you know, doing actually quite nice, thing. helpful things. But they are a really, really dodgy organisation, and I think we should be raising a very serious question about. It. The, the second thing is in terms of what. what the, 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 what happens in this film and what happens with this kind of Western view is, it, is we need goodies and baddies. So Coins the baddie and Museveni's government are the goodie. Now the government which, um, and the forces, the military forces which, which um, the, um, uh, this um, Invisible Children are supporting, are advocating as the solution. If you were in, throughout this war, every time there was an, a, an attack on the, on the LRA and, and a successful uh, ambush on the LRA, the UPDF always did this extraordinary thing. They rescued seven uh, kidnapped children and they killed 12 rebels. Um, it was extraordinary. They never killed a rescued children, a, a child uh, who was kidnapped, and they never um, uh, rescued a, a rebel. You know, it's just extraordinary. But just the whole uh, language Callum, just of this. Uh, on, on the subject which we're currently on, do, you <laughs> earlier said that the film presented an African bogeyman, was your, your yeah. language. So c can you let us know, is that your major problem with this? That it boils down all of the region's problems to one man we've got to get. Is that why you don't my, like my, this? My film? problem goes beyond simply, I mean, it's very easy. I think, this, this, see, I think underlying this current, you can tell as a, as a minister's son how much I'm concerned about <laughs> all these things. Um, underlying all these issues is, is this kind of Christian kind of agenda. I think the Christian agenda was hugely significant behind the success of the campaign. Um, it's there behind uh, World Vision, it's there behind all sorts of quite sinister things. That, that are, are going on. What, like love thy neighbour? Uh, no, 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 no. no, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, Do unto others. Yeah, exactly. I mean, the, the film is five years too late, as um, Musa said, maybe basically. 10 years. Well, maybe ten years too late. Um, but, and NGOs do have to be held to account. There is absolutely no question about that either. But looking at some of the, the children that we work with, they are not your downtrodden children. They're very proud of where Absolutely. they've come from. Absolutely. And they, you know, they, are, they stand up and they're, they're just, they're amazing. Oh, yeah. And it's like we're survivors. And when they took the film out to Karamoja and Padere, into, you know, up into the regions, um, and showed it on little video screens that they put up, stones were thrown at the bloody screen. It's like, you know, we've come to a point where we are calm and we want, you know, we want to get on together and we don't want any of this aggravation. And rocks and stones were, were, were hurled at the, the screen because of this.
But what? these gov but people in Africa and governments in Africa want money and they want aid. So they, you know, what's wrong with a film that raises the prospects of uh, attention from people in the room? Because it was wrong. It, it, it didn't have the whole story. That uh, you know, so we've we talked about this about the complexity of the situation. None of that was put through. Nobody wants to be represented in a piss poor way. I mean, do they? That's, <laughs> that's, uh, one microphone there. One, two, and then we'll go around the room. Hi, um, I'm a digital producer at CNN and I, you know, watch this thing go viral literally every morning reporting into my superiors on, you know, how, how it was doing. And um, I don't think the panel has really, or maybe you can answer, those of you who want to, why you think it was so successful because I think we're all missing the point that it had 85 million views on YouTube, not forgetting over 40 million on Vimeo. So we're looking at well over 100 million. Now, yesterday, UNICEF had their um, Seller Now campaign, which was a 24-hour social media campaign for hunger. That thing hardly, I, I mean, it yeah. didn't even become a worldwide trend on Twitter. Okay. Why? What, what is it about Good Coney? Good question. Uh, I, I have a background in communications. Um, I worked for five years in PR and communications. Um, so I've had a look at this from a PR angle, and I can sort of quickly break it down, if I may. Several elements to this. So firstly, um, Jason Russell is from an evangelical Christian background. Evangelical communities give you a captive audience. So if you've got a mega church of several thousand people every Sunday hearing a particular message, Invisible Children have been around for a while. They've been priming these audiences to hear this message for a great time. And it is that eternal story of good against evil. And what um, he said in a YouTube interview a few years ago was, we need a quick win with Coney. And the story is a beautiful one. You know, talk about the bogeyman, but also it's that kind of redemptive Old Testament type rhetoric that plays very well. That's the first element. Second element is... But it's not quick. It took him eight years. Well, no, 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 no. He built, he built the grassroots. Let's, let's just, can I, can I finish, please? Um, so the second, <laughs> the, second, the, second, the, second, the second element that's vital, this was a bit of a black swan because this story emerged at a time when there were no other huge media stories at the time. So we didn't have like a 9-11, the same competing for space. That was maybe a luck element, right? And one they didn't anticipate. The third element was that we had almost a Hollywood-style production value to the film. If you've got Christopher Nolan doing a half-hour Dark Knight-style Coney video, trust me, it would have got you know, an amazing response, a visceral response. The fourth element, which you can't forget, is that this had an element of the icing on the cake of the support that was mobilized, which didn't exist in the Bob Geldof times. We had people like Kim Kardashian, right? People who only tweet once or twice a day, whose tweets will be retweeted by everybody. Ed Sheeran, Russell Simmons, uh, Justin Bieber. All, Justin Bieber tweets all the time, right? He, he, he's, he's, always, so he's always trending on Twitter. If Justin Bieber, Ed Sheeran, Kim Kardashian all tweet about the same thing in the same hour, it will go viral. That's a guarantee. And when it is of that same quality, it's going to go viral. That's your answer. I don't think there was a guarantee that it would go viral. And I think they were aiming at half a million. And I think they would have been that's very, that's very conservative, very, very happy. Nobody could have predicted this. You'd be, cr you'd be um, crazy to. I'd have, I'd have predicted five million for this. Did video. your viewers Easy. in Africa think, in the, all the countries of Africa that you are broadcast <laughs> in? Can we have the microphone back to you, uh, without giving away too much about your company? But did they think that it portrayed? people in living in African countries as victims waiting for the West to canter in. Did you hear what they said in reply? It, it, was, it was half and half. You know, we ha it's pretty much how this room is split, perhaps. You know, people thinking, great that people are paying attention, but others saying, no, we look weak. And you came in here, I don't know if you paid £12 like everybody else, but did you, you came in to answer the question, why did it go viral? Did the panel answer that for you? Because if you leave without answering the question, they'll give you your money back. <laughs> you know, I, I, I'll, I'll add as a, as a, well... No, you can't I don't, add, I don't did think, they answer your question? I, I don't think any of us yet have put our finger well, on why it went so viral. I mean, yesterday with uh, UNICEF's campaign, you had Selena Gomez and all these young celebrities tweeting too. I, I mean... There's no passion there. Jason Russell believes, he completely believes in what he's doing and he's got that, he's got that passion. The guy's crazy. Yeah, and he also no, set well, it up really well. He, he, I, I, I yeah. agree Hang with Hang on, he's, he's, he's in hospital, so we, we, we won't say that about <laughs> him at the moment. So, to you, yeah. I, ju I just want to say here, we're sort of discussing this um, whole idea of Coney the bogeyman and Africans as being victims. But let's not forget that the ICC hit list absolutely. is absolutely one. littered. First. Top 10 are all Africans. Why? Right. So oh, would you keep? Well, hang, on, hang on. Hang on. Hang <laughs> on. Hang on. <laughs> you're difficult to hear, but your point should, must be heard. So you, it's quite difficult. Name. So no, your no, point no, is no. that yeah. the yeah. IC, the International yeah. Criminal yeah. Court is focused yeah. on African uh, exactly. uh, bogeymen. Would you well, like to respond? Well, is that is that Africa's problem or is that the ICC's problem? 
I would argue that's probably the ICC's problem. I and, agree. And the ICC yeah. is supposed to be an apolitical organization, but I think it's, it'll take all of 12 seconds to prove that it's indeed very, very political. Very and political. primarily it's political because it encourages state impunity. And we've just seen that, when was it? A couple of weeks ago. It was on the same day, right? The Lubanga verdict, which, which again encouraged state impunity. I, I mean, I think the ICC, you know, one of the, one of the <laughs> problems with the ICC, I mean, I'm in favor of the ICC in principle completely, yeah. but the ICC, you know, America wouldn't, uh, yeah, America wouldn't support it. it. There was all sorts of complications going on in the important countries. Uh, and so uh, Ocampo and, and, and his crew went for the easy targets and they went for African bogeymen and without any regard for the havoc that those were going to cause. Because what okay. happened in Uganda, what happened with the, the uh, coin and Bashir and all those things happening right at the time of the peace talks was actually very destructive. So it's, again, it's a hugely complex issue. But actually, I think the ICC is responsible for helping screw up those peace talks. And that, that causes me great concern because I think they were doing it as an easy target to show that they could work and get some baddies. And if they were African bogeymen, that's all the easier. OK. And to, to you? Yeah, I, was, <coughs> I was just going to say that um, all the panellists have kind of said that this has become, that they've simplified a very complex issue with this film. Um, I, I would just, I, I think one would assume that the um, invisible children are quite well aware of the further complex issues involved in this. Mm. So I guess my question would be, why did they choose to simplify it in the way they did? Well, they're not here. What's your I know, answer? Well, I mean, I don't know. Do, would any of you guys have an idea? I mean, we can only speculate, but I think the point is that it was a choice, right? Of course they're aware of this. But of course they've, they've also very clearly chosen, for example, to have the chief prosecutor of the ICC in their video, and they've very clearly chosen their stance. Why they take that stance is indeed a question that needs to be but asked. But I mean, surely they must have known it would it would then open themselves All up. All right, to just it. because I'm <laughs> chairing, I, I will give you a, a statement from Invisible <laughs> Children, and then we'll come to your question. We have found that many Ugandans welcome the film's message of stopping Joseph Kony, but some take offence at how the message was delivered. Admittedly, Kony 2012 was geared towards young Western audiences who don't know anything, in an effort to raise awareness of what began in Uganda but is currently taking place in the Democratic Republic of Congo, Central African Republic and South Sudan. So they're saying, get over yourself, we raised an issue that you didn't know anything about. So over to you. Um, Nicholas Meller, uh, Musa kindly broke down the success into four key components. Shove it up your face. Uh, yep. <laughs> Musa <laughs> broke down, broke down the, the success of the viral, you know, the viral video into four components. With only one of which was, you know, the black swan, the timing that there was no other big news items going on. So is it a model that could be replicated? And how soon do we expect to, to see Kony 2012 being beaten by other viral videos that have been... Oh, we're making one now. Watch <laughs> out. Watch out the video. Take down her okay. URL. <laughs> I think absolutely it can be replicated. I think if you've got, a fa look, like I say, if you get a top-class Hollywood um, director, and listen, all respect to the quality of the production of that film, tremendous. If you have a top-class uh, you know, Hollywood director, Fantastic actors, great narratives, and a really compelling, immersive movie. You will get you won't get 100 million hits because we've you won't. Get Go on. We've done it. We've seen it well, lots of times before. I will allow you your cynicism. All I'm saying is, <laughs> no, no, I will allow it. But all I'm saying, I'm saying is, they mobilised yes. a group of exactly. social. But look, look, no online campaign can exist without strong grassroots. You look at all these viral videos that are done well. You look at Ed Sheeran's success when he was playing that amazing tune on YouTube. Ed Sheeran played 300 gigs in one year. That's why he went viral, because all people that had seen him already, all people who'd done Invisible Children, you know, night vigils already in the previous five, six years, were like, I've done that, I recognise it, I'll forward it on. So it was allied to, you have this top-down structure of online media, allied to a very strong grassroots movement, and that's why it worked so but well. But he had music that people wanted to hear. And the okay? story was They had a message that people that's wanted to hear, and NGOs, what they do really well is worthy. And everybody says that's good because it's worthy, but they're lying. It's rubbish, and nobody wants to watch so it. So that's why they don't go viral. They're coming for you now. The gentleman asks, "Should it be should it be cloned? What's your advice?" You can't look. You can't think clone about it. Hollywood, I right? Don't think so. Do we know how to make a blockbuster? No, there is no magic. There is no magic. Um, no, I recipe. don't. No, I don't think it can be replicated necessarily. I think it's done now. This this was the phenomenon, you know. We will all be sitting here in five years' time going, you know, Coney 2012, that was a good viral one. 
Well, look, I think, and again, look, Thriller will never be replicated, but no one stopped making hit albums. People know how to write hit songs. People know how to write hit songs. Look, look half, a mil half a million views was a conservative estimate. You may not get 100 million, but you don't need 100 million. If you get 5 million hits of a fantastically made viral video with complexity, with the main issues in there, then go for it. And I think that's possible. And there are so many lessons to be drawn from this, and I think the NGOs should be taking these lessons forward. Yeah, but so they'll go too far. All the NGOs will go too far. Every single NGO is sitting there trying to make that video today. Right, so that's your answer, is it? Is uh, one, <laughs> one other point, though. No, you can't have another point. Over to you. Oh. No, sorry, over oh. to you. Over to you. Over to you. Yep, now. I'd like to make two points. One about uh, <laughs> the video. I'm, uh, I, I know Jason Russell. And also one about Kony, Marika and myself met Joseph Kony in 2006. Um, I would disagree actually with the panel's view that if you kill, I, I believe that if you do kill Joseph Kony, you stop the uh, LRA. There are lots of rebels and lots of bandits around that country and they'll continue. But I think he is the, um, the icon of that group and I think that he has huge power. Um, and I think if you kill him, you do kill the LRA. Um, I was encouraged by the film um, Coney 2012 because I know of no campaign that has encouraged more young people, more people, to care about others on the other side of the world who they'll never meet. And I thought it was a huge success and um, I'm a supporter. So would you like to keep the microphone? Um, wh who was going to respond? I would like to come straight back actually. I didn't say that the, um, I never actually said that uh, stopping Coney would not stop the other. I never said that. Um, I'm a supporter of the visibility, but there are profound problems. There are profound problems, um, which moved me to the point of anger within the half-hour film that Museveni was not mentioned. Uh, this is a man that came to power um, through military, you know, through military prowess, and for 26 years has not somebody, is not in his back garden. And that is a vital emission and a dangerous emission, I have to say. I'm a supporter of the campaign to stop Coney, but conversation cannot stop there, I'm afraid. I'm very sorry, I have to say that. I, I, I mean, it's, you know, getting people to care. What does that mean, people care about cream eggs, you know? I mean, it's what <laughs> they care about. It. It's what they care about that matters. <laughs> and, I'm, and I'm sorry, if you take, I mean, I, 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 if you take the goodwill, I, I wrote a piece about this in the Huffington Post. It, it, what they did was they mobilized this kind of Frankenstein of goodwill, um, which they then misdirected. Um, uh, and, and specifically um, a, not only misdirected but actually made them support a solution which is actually to do with, at its heart, is to do with um, strengthening the West's involvement with Museveni, strengthening America's military links with a deeply corrupt and dangerous and increasingly autocratic government. This isn't making people, this is, uh, they've made them care and they've distorted that goodwill and turned it into something which is actually potentially really quite dangerous for that region. Well, do you agree with our friend who's still got the microphone, so you can speak for yourself, killing the man who enjoys abducting children is I, going I, to do some good? No, I mean, if, you know, if I heard that Joseph Coyne was dead, I would, you know, be celebrating. Of so, course, yes, you agree and, with and, 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 you know, it would certainly not be a bad thing. So you agree but it's with not, No, I'm not saying that's not the solution. It's not but, the solution. No, but his point is... This film raised awareness just on the name of the film. If this man was either arrested or uh, well, killed, hang on there. I mean, you know, if American and, and Ugandan forces triumphantly go in, invade uh, Central African Republic, execute this man, and portray themselves as some kind of heroes, is that a good thing? Well, is the damage done by that internationally and in the region greater than the advantage of killing one particularly evil, unpleasant would you person? Like to answer I think that? it probably would be. I don't know. I mean, I would say that. Obama probably wouldn't have announced that he was sending 100 troops. Maybe Mike's point was that they may have been there already in one sense, but he would probably wouldn't have announced that unless he wanted there to be a solution. Did, did you I say, would say that, sorry, can did, I No, hang on. Did, did you say that you met Coyne with Marika? Yes. We, so met, we spent two days with him, or so a day with him. Uh, having met him, would you kill him? <laughs> um, Fair question. I, I would support you? him being killed. But so no, you, so you hate him so much you want some, an American to kill him? <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not a soldier, I'm a, I'm a journalist. Right. I mean, you, beat, you don't kill the cow, I think you, you can have a bit of removal. Yeah, yeah we have, but unfortunately not everyone will hear if we don't give you the microphone. But the panel is responding to the gentleman in the audience. He supports the film, he supports the killing of the man. Would you like to respond to him? 
Well, I have a point about Obama's solution. I, I think the well, we'll just we'll come to that. Just oh, on no, his no, question. I just pick up on, the, on his point. Um, Obama's solution was an announcement in front of the White, White House. I, I'm really not sure what kind of solution that is. And I think the second question is, what is the solution supposed to do? Supposed to pursue an evangelical aim of killing the bogeyman or to make a situation better? Yes, the LRA might disappear. The situation will not be better because the situation is much more complex. That will give a victory to people who uh, like to narrow things down to such a to such a narrow view, but it doesn't actually change the situation. So what's the goal? Exactly. Is it uh, but it, you know, and you can say that around the world as well. You Absolutely. know, you've got Saddam, you've got Gaddafi, you've got um, who was that geezer who was thrown in the in in Al Qaeda, whatever his name was. Um, you know, where are those Osama people now? <laughs> You know, what is happening to the people that they destroyed as well? Nothing. OK, now we're going around the room again. Uh, you've got the microphone there, sir, and then it's coming to the front. Yeah, sorry, I just want to... Uh, there's been a lot of talk of this uh, 100 million supporters mobilised and all of that, and I just want to... I think it's important to realise that actually these supporters or this 100, these 100 million hits uh, were cheaply bought. They weren't... This isn't... Uh, these aren't 100 million supporters. For one, uh, it counts as a hit even if they go onto the YouTube page. There are thousands of news aggregation sites where you can where the videos are automatically embedded and that'll count as a hit. And so I just I just uh, want to mention that these are, true. Okay. These are cheaply bought cheaply bought hits. And be, also these player. people these people that it's not made to appeal true. to, yeah. they will suddenly recede to kind of a stream of apathy can I, after this thirty minutes um, can I promise of wasted to, attention. To call you back in about fifteen minutes yeah. when we're going to do clicktivism but we're going to keep on the subject of the film. You've got the microphone here. Well, I sort of agree that there are two nightmares J here. James, hold not, it there. Not only you? Coney, but, um, but the media. And I can understand why the panel, which is not just a, a media organization, uh, keeps using the word complexity like putting a cork in a bottle. What complexity are we talking about? If Coney has produced a zone which has no finances in it, as you claim, uh, no corporations, I've heard the public relations man of Rio Tinto talking about the importance of secret armies, private armies. I mean, Coney must be operated by somebody. There's a whole history of warlords in the region. They're all under influences of some kind. They all had sources of finances. Expensive thing running an army. You're not telling us who this man is and why he's there. Well, I, I mean, well, I, I think I did. I, th I think, you know, the point is that Coyne emerged, um, emerged as, as the speaker over there said, out of absolutely legitimate grievances by the Acholi people. Coyne emerged out of a, a, com a, a complex, I'm not allowed to use that word, out of a situation which had lots of issues in it which made it complex. <laughs> um, I, and, 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 you know, and, and actually represent, he wasn't, you know, he isn't just a loony. He didn't emerge as some kind of psychopathic loony. He, 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 yeah, he, I mean, he, he, his legitimacy, his justification was to do with that, that situation at the time. The point is he very, very quickly, it descended into what is effectively a cult. It very quickly descended into preying on the very people he, he claims to represent. Um, so in that sense, he is quite unique, but he also operated very, very cleverly. Two things made him very, very effective. One was that he had the support of Khartoum, and that, if you like, they were his backers. They were his backers purely as a proxy to cause havoc to Uganda for no other reason. Um, uh, and secondly, he is a, you know, this stupid, ignorant, um, a, you know, African villager is a brilliant military strategist right. and, and, and an extremely effective, he's invented a whole way of fighting, which he is extremely good at. And, and, he, and he, in the room, we've got two people who've met him. Mm. So, Marika, uh, did you think he was a shrewd person? Did you think he was a murderous, psychopathic person? I'm not a psychologist. I can't honestly answer that from spending time with him. Obviously, he didn't murder anyone in my presence, and I can't, uh, I can't speak to a psychological or, or psychiatric um, diagnosis. It's just impossible. I, did he I appear to be a puppeteer he, or the well, question? I, I, you know, I, I've always found that focus on him somewhat misplaced, and that's actually, the, that's actually what I took away from it most. Was but the that person who the made time, the film with you would have him shot. Well, he wouldn't shoot him himself, though, apparently. So, um, I mean, I, I just think he was a, a rebel leader who had been in the bush for a long time who at that time was trying to initiate uh, peace negotiations. Well, why not just arrest him then? Okay, well, which, what about that? Would you support that? An arrest by the ICC? Yes. Yeah, sure, if that was a possibility, um, if that was done fairly, if that would give a fair trial. And, uh, you know, there was a time when the LRA was, was debating going to The Hague um, because they felt that that was a way to actually... Um, make their statements against the Ugandan army, who of course hadn't been and hadn't had an arrest warrant issued against them. So Coming it might Musa. be interesting. Yeah, can I say I'd arrest him actually, I wouldn't kill him because he then you martyr him, then he becomes this mythical figure. Mm. No, bang him up in chains, put him in a jail, and let him sweat in a cold room for the rest of his life because then he's humiliated and then all his people can sit there and go, oh, they caught our big man. That's what you need. You cannot make this man any more mythical than he actually is already. Yeah.
in my opinion. My initial point is no longer um, at the topic, but I think to this point, the, the objective of the video was never to kill Kony. It was always to bring him to justice, number one. And do you support that yourself as a yes, citizen? Yes, definitely. And did the film make you understand this problem that you'd never heard about before? Oh, completely. And to the point about uh, you know caring, um, I didn't care. B I didn't care before um, watching the video. I I was most touched by the disfigurements um, that were happening. You know the, the the people whose noses and lips were cut off, and I researched that. And I found out that these people can't eat food because it falls out of their mouth. And so I found different charities. That, that help and provide plastic surgery, Living Hope being one of them, um, and supported that charity. So what do you read into equivocation from the people in the panel? Some of them have expressed doubts about the film, and you've heard from the floor, someone who supports the filmmaker. What do you read into the doubts that you're hearing from some in the room and some on the panel? Well, I think, I think a lot of it is collectivism, as, as we're going to discuss, I'm sure. Um, but don't, and don't, don't underestimate the viewers. I, I didn't... I didn't um, support, I didn't put any money into this campaign, but I found others that I was drawn to because of this campaign. I would just, just very quickly, a uh, quick, quick footnote, I was saying at the time that what we would be doing, instead of ang getting angry about this, was every NGO that works in the area is doing work, use the Cone 2012 hashtag and advertise what you're doing. Hey, look, we've been doing this in, in, you know, and use that window of opportunity. I know not everyone uses Twitter, but that one week of opportunity was absolutely vital for visibility. It's free publicity. And did you want to respond? Yeah, well, I just, I, I totally agree with this. I disagree with this idea that you can't help, you can't do anything. It's just a, a, route, a road to apathy. And I've never, I, you know, this last two years, I've worked with Medicine Sans Frontier in the Congo and Oxfam in, um, in Zimbabwe this year. I've been very cynical about big NGOs. Mm. The work that I've seen has been remarkable, totally and utterly. They're all done by local people, all done by indigenous people. J j transforming people's lives and I don't see any of the people that they're helping saying sorry we don't want your help to to in investment in infrastructure and things that can actually not just long-term solutions so I think we've got to be very very careful that we don't just say you know you cannot assist people or make a difference or that is somehow completely patronizing thing to do because it isn't and, 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 and good for you yeah but so if, if people did stone the screens they don't actually matter. No, they so matter. And that's so that matter. the most important thing for me out of the whole thing that hasn't been discussed today. The best thing for me is that a blogger, a Ugandan blogger, went on YouTube and said, you know what, this is a load of bollocks. And you, a million people watched her. A million people watched a Ugandan blogger. And I thought, hallelujah, we're starting to have a conversation which mm. includes the voices that are really most important in this conversation. Not me, not the people at Invisible Children, but the people on the ground, very, very yeah. intelligent, really, really clued up, who've got extremely important things. And we're going to start listening to them. That is brilliant, because we will get closer to the truth, whatever that is, through this conversation. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I agree with an awful lot of what you said. The problem is that there were an awful lot of people in northern Uganda at the time of the peace talks who were desperately saying these peace talks have to go on. They were the Acholi religious, I was slagging mm -hmm. off the, the Godbothers, but the Acholi religious leaders are a deeply impressive organization. And there's some very, very good people. They were all desperately wanting to be listened to. They were all saying these peace talks have to go on. They were all saying, do not let there be another stupid military offensive. And they weren't listened to. And the trouble is that the people who perhaps could have made them listen, which is invisible children, weren't it's saying that. that. They were back, they were slowly building up to their campaign to have a military campaign. And, and, and you, crucially, crucially, sorry, the peace talks brought peace. You okay. know, that's yeah, always, always absolutely. Yep. And to they you there, peace. and then to the back. Yeah, I just wanted to ask about um, uh, Miss Evany being in the film. I was in Uganda last year at the time of the election, and Miss Evany's, a lot of his posters said, uh, vote Miss Evany, the guy who's put down 23 rebellions in 20, how many years he's been in, in power. Mm. So he's positioning himself as a tough guy. Mm. And I was wondering whether you felt that the fact that um, he doesn't appear in the film, he's not really mentioned in, uh, by the Invisible Children people, and whether or not they're kind of colluding with him. I mean, it's very difficult to operate in Uganda and certainly to have those kind of production values without some kind of agreement with the government. Um, are they essentially helping Miss Evany's kind of political campaigns in the future? Yeah. Well, who's going to take that? Absolutely. Well, uh, hang on. Well, let's start well, with you, it, Amanda. I think that's a bit of a, a cynical view, although it might just be. Uh, but Miss Evany is, is not without guilt. 
and that's also that's got to be that's got to be out there. And but the gentleman saying, does a film that focuses in a way that you earlier warned us was simplistic, aid Museveni by simplifying and leaving him out? Yeah, Is, probably. Yeah, definitely. Would, um, to you, Marika? Well, it, it was interesting, right? Um, in the first few days, I would have said yes, absolutely. And I mean, obviously, Invisible Children work with Miss Seventy. It's you know, there's no secret, absolutely. Um, and you're absolutely right. They couldn't make these kind of films, especially at the time when most people were still in displacement camps and you know doing helicopter shots and so on. Wouldn't have been possible without very close uh, collaboration with the government. But then, of course, something really interesting happened, which uh, it turned into a bit of a PR disaster for Uganda, right? Mm. And then all of a sudden, you, the Ugandan government had to get up and say, "Well, uh, wait a second, we're actually not." Mm. A country that is run by a warlord and you can still come here and, and look at the gorillas and you know it's it's <laughs> and, and gorillas not gorillas and <laughs> it's actually you know it's a nice place so, so I think actually that's a really interesting point earlier we, we talked a little bit about the fact that none of us actually really understand the implications of this and I think the implications changed almost by the day and I think on day one the Ugandan government thought fantastic mm. and on day 10 not so much anymore because of course criticism also mounted and that probably goes into this whole point that we've discussed here that it's we don't understand how this works. It's a very textured and generous thing of you to say because you'd earlier been quite strident in your criticism and now you're saying actually it may have harmed the 70, it may have actually aided the overall spotlight focusing on this country and mm. given the criticism you made earlier it's a very interesting point to hear you make. Thank you for raising it. We're going to move on to clicktivism in about five minutes. Can I ask if people in the room haven't been heard on the film? If you came here paying good money on the film do you want to be heard now? Because you can be. But if it's not about the film, everyone will be very cross with you. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's about the film. I'm just not sure I'm going to add anything. I love this film. I just love it. And I hate it. And it made me so angry. But what I love is that people like us who've been ranting about this for years over wine with friends at dinner, people like Sam who've been working on these stories for years to Who's tell Sam? these... Sorry? journalist, wonderful Put filmmaker, right. and has worked his butt off and put himself on the line to tell these stories. And we suddenly are able to do this. These things that we've been so passionate about in our own homes and with our own friends, we have this platform across the Western world to do that. I've, I've had trouble with invisible children for years, always struggled with them, but I just think, can we agree or can I ask the panel individually to say, would you rather this film never existed? I, I hate question. it because, it's it because all it's done is simplified something that we know, because we've worked on this for years, is so complex. Okay, you're winning. It's a great question. I'll stop now. And they can answer it. But keep, no, keep the microphone in case they don't answer you. But go ahead. I'm Thank totally you. grateful for this film. And I've said this from the start. I absolutely welcome the scrutiny because now people can... My parents fled. They fed it on me in the 70s. No one ever questioned that. You know, Museveni has been up to all kinds of things in Uganda in the last few years. You know, some have been fantastic for our economy, but he's actually made some great mistakes. And this video actually opens uh, up to scrutiny how he's dealt with Cody. So it's so a yes to its existence. Absolutely, absolutely. absolutely it's a great. Yes. No question. Yeah, I can't add anything to <laughs> it. It's a yes. Uh, I, I wish Invisible Children would never exist, actually. And I don't mean this <laughs> at all personally. I mean as an organization, because I, I agree with Cullen that they play a great part in the failure of the peace talks because they pushed for military intervention at a time when things, in a, in a very messy peace process, but one that brought peace to the Uganda. They and have also that much power, that, you think? Well, they, they did. I don't, and and I don't like disagree with you on invisible children. Million dollars. But the film? And, you know, the first few weeks of a messy military intervention cost much, much more, and it's been so much worse for so many hundreds of thousands of people. So and I think... But, but if you could go back three weeks ago and you had a choice, yes, this film goes or no, it doesn't. What would you say? Sorry, I didn't. I didn't see the. If you had a choice of this film existing or not existing, those are your only choices. No, I, I, I don't think it will. I don't think it will bring much good, to be honest. No. I so it's a no. I, I think it's a really, really difficult thing to answer. I, I it was a, sitting at a meeting, a screening question. a film I'd made about um, coin. Um, about four years ago, and there was half as many people here as there are now. So yeah, on one level, the debate is hugely increased. But on the other, I, actually in a way, I can't tell yet whether this film is going to do more harm than good. It has done some good, it has raised the profile of the issue, but it has already done a lot of harm. What lay behind the film scuppered the peace talks, what lay See, behind, and, I, and I, what the, film, well then okay. the film's role in the future... From, you would, just need a yes or no, because from an NGO's point of view, they, they, did, they violated the first rule, they've done harm. Okay, but, but that's not the point. Yeah, this yeah. film, in and of itself, yes the, or no, existed. Uh, this, the, if this film legitimizes... I come back to the point I've made before. If this film legitimizes um, 
uh, America's continuing adventure in that part of right. Africa and legitimizes and strengthens the hand of Museveni, who, which is an increasingly dangerous hand, then I think that in the long run this film will have done harm. Good point. Yeah, it, it's, it's good. And, and it allows people to talk to about Amanda, this. Amanda, yeah. Amanda, it's um, not, it's not a yes from Callum, is it? 100 million <laughs> people <laughs> watched that video. In percentage terms, within the four days that, that, that those numbers were rising, the War Child um, website got far more hits because, and people were actually asking for other information. And I think that that is what the film has done. The, one of the only positives I can see is that there is a percentage, however large or small, and again, we won't know that for a long time yet, Wait, on wait, wait. what is go you, what? Okay, thank you. I'm going to give you some closing thought time as well. But you've got the microphone. Yeah. Then we're we'll coming um, back to you. The film must have been a success. But um, when it comes to using young people, y using children, where do we actually draw the line? Very because good. I could Very see um, Jason Very using important. his own son to try to appeal to your emotions. Hold that thought. Is anyone else? Do you want to come back on what you heard? You, you you met the man. You support the filmmaker. He's a friend of yours. Otherwise, I'm going to move on. I, I'd, say, um, I'd say a few things. Carry on and I'll... Okay, thank you for your permission. <laughs> okay, so we're moving on to clicktivism and I promise to come back to you, sir. You, you started us on this and then I'll come back to your point about children and then we'll panel things you haven't said or were, were you were contorted or, or, or everything will come to you. I can make one wager. No, not now you can't. No. <laughs> Over to you. Over to you. I'll come back to you, I promise, but well, not now. I, I will actually... Um, all I wanted to say was that it's not a hundred million people. Uh, it's not a hundred. It's, it's not a hundred million uh, um, p um, p views actually watching the video all the way through. In fact, I I would I would um, contend that the that most of them didn't watch it all the way through. And also, it's 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 important to recognise that this isn't the same as a hundred million people going to a cinema screening, yeah. where it actually takes effort. Uh, this is about a hundred million people. Or uh, this is about a lot of people sitting bored of their computers on the internet and then seeing on their streams, their Twitter streams, their Facebook streams, or whatever, or the news aggregation sites, and saying, okay, um, that this has got a lot of you know, votes or whatever, I'm going to click on it. Right, and that's but we've it. heard from about five people. And then they, and then they the like room, it and they share with it. You. Rosie, the lady over there, the two at the back, they say actually it educated them and they went out and sought more information. So you Well, I think, I think if we're the. Ed well, I don't think that we, the people here that are actually interested in this, I don't think we're the majority of people. Okay, I, don't, so I think the majority of people are just the, the, the like It's or superficial whatever. interest. I think there, there is a lot of issue about clicks. Let me just tell you a very, very, very brief story that is quite enlightening. I was asked to go and film a, a Syrian woman for a very, very major, one of the biggest clicktivist organizations. Um, and I was filmed it in her house in, um, in uh, not, not too far from here. And then we had a script, she read this script, we, she read it in Syrian, we sent it back to, the, to this major, major NGO. Um, they said, oh, we don't like this woman's voice, so um, we're gonna get another woman's voice from somewhere else, and then we're gonna put this onto your video. When the video went out on the um, Guardian website, the video was um, supposed to have been recorded in Homs or somewhere like that in Syria. The woman was a Syrian mo mother and she had written the script, okay? This wasn't even her voice. It was written by one of the most obnoxious people I've ever had to displeasure of working with in Lebanon, yeah? So the point, the point about that is, is we must be looking at this stuff with a very, very skeptical. First thing I knew about it is when I read it in The Guardian. We've got to be looking at these organizations who are doing advocacy. There's a massive difference between advocacy, journalism, and aid. OK, we're coming to, um, to the question of clicktivism and then closing thoughts in the panel. In the room, do people think, uh, if people who haven't spoken before, do people think this is a new type of campaign? Yes, you can have the microphone. We'll give the microphone. And then it's like, is it, does this, what we're all in here, represent a new chapter? So I just have a question about, um, about the film again, or the use of the, the, use of the film. Uh, it won't be answered now. It'll be saved for the closing thoughts. Okay, but what wh is it? What about the ethics of using young Ugandans affected by the war in films to kind of sell bracelets and tell their stories and have them advocate to American school children in, perp on, you know, in person? Will you, will you keep that in your closing thoughts panel, the question from that uh, lady there about using young people in Uganda to sell? Now, you, you, I cut you off. You can have it back now. I think an important point to make is that Kony is very much alive and still active, and people have even died in the last month. And one key thing is to say that this 
this film has raised political will. And Marika made a very good point that the US government probably do know where Coney is. We, we, when we were with him, we saw that he had numerous satellite phones. Satellite phones can be tracked, they can be traced. And I do think this has raised the political will to try and clamp down him. Now, I'd rather he'd be arrested, just to correct your further point. But if he can't be arrested, which I think that, which he can't, I don't think, I think that's, that's why I would be in favour of him being killed. Thank you for clearing that up. And uh, let me just ask you uh, this about the clicktivism. The film makes the point that they are targeting culture makers. And um, I thought that was quite new language for me. They, they identified 20 people, and I think you were talking about this, Musa. They called them culture makers. They identified people who were Twitter storm uh, weather gurus who could bring the reins on Twitter. Yeah. Do you think they're right? Whatever we think about this film, whatever we think about the issue, are they right that that's a good way to get your drums heard by going after 20 people, even if it's Beyonce, to talk about you know, British yeah. drug running? I think it's incredible. I think it's a brilliant piece of marketing. I, I, I would advocate the same. Absolutely. Who, who, give me some culture makers in Britain. Stephen Fry. Yeah. Stephen Fry. Um, who's the other guy? Uh, the comedian, the really controversial guy. Um, uh, the Scottish one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Frankie, Frankie, Frankie Boyle. Stephen Fry, Boyle. Frankie Boyle. Charlie um, Brooker. Yeah, absolutely. Charlie Brooker. Um, so if, if, guys, have, yeah. if people in the room have issues, they want Stephen Fry, Charlie Brooker and Frank Boyle to go on about it. People love comedians. They love laughing. They love laughing, love entertainment. If someone can dress it up in a way that's... Look at Futurama, look at The Simpsons. People love that. They love combining a bit of satire uh, with something which is fun, accessible. They love that stuff. Absolutely. I think it's a great idea. Do you find this ob uh, objectionable? Well, I, no, I don't. I mean, I, I've just made two films um, uh, about Sri Lanka's killing fields, um, which have, you know, were, were presented by Jon Snow. That gave them gravitas. I mean, he, 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 he presented them. He didn't, you know, that's what he did. Um, I am now trying to make those into a single film, and I am uh, trying to get George Clooney to narrate it and, and MIA to do the title track. So, of course, that's kind of quite... I don't know if I'll succeed, but um, that, that, of course, is, is, um, is, is quite legitimate. I don't have a problem with that at all. And do you think that they did anything new in this film by going after retweets from 20 targeted individuals? I, 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 that's just... That's campaign. I mean, I'm not, you know, I, I'm not really that... I think it was a successful campaign. I think much probably more important was the base amongst the... Uh, evangelical Christian community in 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 in, um, in in America, which was the kind of the mass base that triggered it and set it all off. Um, I think that using uh, you know famous names and, and doing all that is perfectly legitimate part of a campaign. The important issue is whether your campaign is worth fighting. Okay, yeah. and we're talking about clicktivism. We're going around the room on the issue of whether it's new or not. I think it's remarkably similar to things like Britain's Got Talent and the X Factor, where you over a period of time build up a, a loyal base that feel an involvement in in the process. You also bring in the sort of celebrity judges who are your sort of retweeters. Uh, and then at the end of it, there's a product that everyone buys into, and the product's the film. Okay. Uh, or the band who emerges from the X Factor. You've so had the microphone, new. so sorry, you can't have it again. So, um, panel, can you give us some closing thoughts, including the things that you, were, you didn't get said correctly? And we'll come to the audience. Um, the thing that you, you thought didn't come out correctly. Uh, starting with you, Amanda. I, one thing we didn't hear from you, and I, I, if I may commend you for not using this in this way, do, by all means, tell us of a project that War Child's doing that backs up an approach that you want us all to consider. But do give us some closing thoughts, and we'll also hear from the room in conclusion. Things that weren't said correctly or things you'd like to reinforce. Well, one of, that's very interesting about me telling you about our projects, because it's not about that. It's about the, the whole media thing for me is a nightmare. We have to tweet, we have to blog, we have to Facebook, we have to twit face or whatever it is <laughs> that we have to do. It takes it away from what we are trying to achieve, which is to help those poor children on the ground. You know, it's the beneficiaries, the people that we want to help. And it's like I've become a media circus. I love it. But You're very in good reality, at thank you very much. <laughs> but in reality... I want to do what I want to do, which is help those people. I want to sit down with those children and say, what do you want us to do for you? And have the conversation with them. I don't need all of this rubbish in, in a way. I do need your money, by the way. So <laughs> click on to War Child, donate to War Child, obviously. But the, the real fact is we have 
have to become so professional in so many different areas to be able to do what we have to do. It's a nightmare. I've got a professional press writer. I've got a professional um, advocacy person. We've got a professional um, online person. That's three human beings that I could have in my programs team on the ground doing child protection, doing psychosocial work, doing life skills training. Can I, um, thank you. Can I, can I go first because it connects directly? Yep. Um, I, I just want to follow up on something. Not only is your time limited to actually do your work if you have to do so much else, Policymakers' attention span and also time is very limited. And actually, it's, it's striking. This happened with Safe Darfur, and it's happening now with Coney 2012. How much time, proportionally, these relatively minor issues take up in relation to all other kinds of issues that are to do with you know, deeper governance issues in, gov in, in Africa and so on, that actually the UN Security Council might be better advised to focus on. But they don't get to focus on it because all the attention is drawn away. It was the same in Safe Darfur, it's the same now. On this one issue, which is a bad issue and it needs to be solved, and we disagree in this room mm -hmm. about the ways of solving it, but it's really not the only issue. And it, it goes back actually to your point, in this big mess of things, the LRA really is a relatively small player, and they have been a relatively small player, which doesn't mean that they should stay there, but uh, that's also the argument why taking out Kony might be a great ideological victory, but it won't make the situation any better. And these kind of issues are displaced. Policymakers only have five minutes to be briefed on something. So that's a real long-term issue to think of. Um, I did watch the film till the end, and I put my hand up for doing that, but I had forgotten <laughs> that extraordinary little bit that we watched at the beginning of this thing, where they implied that there was this thing where the people <laughs> with power and all the rest of it and the money and the influence at the top, and we're turning it on its head. Actually, um, and so that the people at the bottom can be heard. The point is that the people who needed to be heard throughout this entire process were the people in the IDP camps, yes. were the Acholi religious yes. leaders, yes. were the people in northern Uganda, uh, and indeed southern Sudan subsequently, and, and then and now Sierra. Yes, yes, Those yes, were the people that needed to be listened to, and actually they weren't listened to. These people who were talking about this pyramid were so busy listening to and backing up and strengthening the voices of the people at the top that they didn't just not listen to the people at the bottom. It isn't a reversal of what they did. They drowned out the people at the bottom. And that's what's so sinister and dangerous about this. And that's what's so grotesque about that um, thing, which was obviously should be run backwards. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I watched your film on, the, on uh, the, the Sri Lanka film. And I'll never forget sitting there watching that film. And, you know, I wish social media could have been used to get your film on at 9 o'clock in the evening, <laughs> not at tell 11 o'clock. And that's, that's a, you know... That's where it's at for me, the, the, the work that you do, and I, I want to pay tri tribute to that. But I also think that we can use um, social media to get stories like the kind that you're trying to tell with the, with the, with the integrity and, and the bravery um, and the impact uh, into, into better schedules, into more people's lives, to get more people connected. The one thing that I learned tonight, very interesting, thank you very much for... For, uh, for, for to this panel, was, was, which you just hinted at, which you just spoke about, is this idea of here you've got this dictator in Uganda and we're focusing on the one guy. I got an email um, a week ago from a friend of mine who's an Ethiopian. He came over here for IVF treatment with his wife and his young son uh, nine months ago. He was supposed to go back on the 28th of August. But on the 27th of August, the Ethiopian government raided his office and they took away his two colleagues. He we used to work together who've been in prison for the, for the last eight months, and nobody knows where they are. 20,000 similar people disappearing under Mellis' government. I was sent out by the BBC, would you believe it, to train the Ministry of Information, the ones who were lying and, and, and covering up all this kind of stuff. So he's now claimed asylum, and, and thank God um, ha has, been, has been given it. There are bigger stories, more important stories, but we can learn to use these tools to get those stories to more people, and I think those are the lessons to be taken away from Coney. Yeah, um, I just, I'd, it'd be a real pleasure to be, um, it's a privilege to be here, and I'm, I would like to say as a closing thing, um, this is such a breath of fresh air. I'm so grateful for the scrutiny this has brought to Northern Uganda. Like, for so many years, my family, you know, we fled this, we've suffered from this. My mother goes every summer and works in the IDP camps in Northern Uganda, no visibility at all. All of a sudden, people are asking questions about 
not only the Coney issue, but also, you know, why is Uganda the number one destination for Lonely Planet Guide as a tourist destination when two years ago it's advocating for the death of gay people? You know, these conversations are now being asked because they're all collateral to the Coney issue. And I'm so grateful for that. So despite everything I've said, my critiques of the video and obviously wishing Mr. Russell a safe return, a speed return to health, I'm grateful that he's put that out there as a platform. Mm. I'm grateful for that. Well, I mean, actually, I think your comments are typical of an evening that's been very textured. And I think everyone would join in wishing an ill person success uh, in getting back to health. Uh, can I pay tribute to our panel tonight? Um, Amanda, you want to be working and you've paid tribute to the video. You've explained what the complexities are and you never went on about your cause, which is very unusual. Uh, Callum, <laughs> you made a film in 2003 and you, we're all Johnny Come Lately, many of us and you managed to keep Everybody your temper. And uh, to you, uh, Mareka, <laughs> yeah. you met the man, and uh, yet you were able to praise this film even though you criticised it. Uh, ben, you called the, for the <laughs> evening to be, to be helped. Yes, she did. She said it brought focus to Uganda, and she said that was the point. Uh, ben, you called for the subject to be aired in public at the Frontline Club. Musa, your family are from there and fled from there, and you listen to the rest of us who live in Penge go on about it. <laughs> so it's a, once again a fabulous panel, but obviously the best audience in London. And it is 8.30 on the nose, which is what we always do with First Wednesday. Begin on time and end on time. Thank you, panel. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Millie.